Good morning, everyone. Hello, Yate. My name is Marsha Grayeyes. I am currently located in Tuba City. I'm originally from Chanta. Uh, today, Change Labs is hosting a webinar with uh, ASU's Emily Gerkins. Um, but before I get into that, I'm going to talk a little bit about Change Labs. So Change Labs is a, we have five programs and we provide uh, workspace, also tools and resources and knowledge for Native American entrepreneurs in the Four Corners area. This includes uh, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. One of the questions that we get asked a lot is how do I start a business? Um, for that reason, we offer uh, business coaching every Monday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. You can book an appointment with us at nativestartup.org forward slash events on our webpage. And normally we have a different um, coach doing sessions every Monday. We also have a business incubator program where we select 10 high potential Native American entrepreneurs yearly to help uh, with their startup ideas and to have them go through a uh, a year, long, a year long course that includes everything from um, doing your startup budget to marketing and elevator pitches, all of those. Another question we get asked a lot is how do I create a website? Uh, we have a YouTube channel where we have over 30 videos and you can go on there and watch some of our videos. Also, don't forget to subscribe. You can also visit our resource page at nativestartup.org forward slash resources. Another question we get asked a lot is how do I get help running my business? We have a co-working space located into the city. It's right behind Denny's on the Moen Kofi side. Uh, we're open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. daily for the remainder of um, October and November. In November, we will be moving out of the space. Will we await the new space to be built um, in the upper side or near the chapter in Tuba City, Arizona? So we also have an app called Res Rising, where we have uh, over 600 businesses um, using that space as a yellow page. So if you're looking for maybe a carpenter in your area, the idea behind the app is that if you type in carpenter, whatever location you're in, let's say Tuba City, Arizona, you would get all the carpenters that are in the area to choose from um, that are native owned. If you have any more questions, you can always email me at marsha.nativestartup.org. Uh, for this webinar, we ask you to stay on mute until Q&A. Type your questions in the chat, um, unless otherwise maybe the speaker or the presenter um, wants a verbal response, then you can verbally respond as well. Uh, this session is being recorded for YouTube and it should be on our YouTube channel within about 48 to 72 hours. And other announcements we have is we are hiring a uh, community advocate, communications and brand manager. You can go to nativestartup.org forward slash jobs to apply for, for the for job with uh, Change Labs. Next Thursday, we have part three of our digital literacy series with uh, Joe Naz of Naz Technology. The topic would be don't get catfished, protect yourself from security threats and scams. And today we have how to legally protect your artwork presented by ASU Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Um, it's presented by Emily Gerkins. She is a second year law student from the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. She's, also, she's interested in intellectual property policy and her previous projects focus on projects relating to Native American intellectual property. Her background is in finance and data analysis and has a bachelor degree from the University of Denver. With her is Michelle Gross, a licensed attorney who serves at the the helm of the Lisa Foundation Patent Law Clinic. Um, she's also hosting part of this event. And Alicia, Caitlin, and Amy are also part of the team as well. 
And without further ado, I'm turning this over to Emily. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for a brief discussion on intellectual property, what it is, what it means for your business. Um, we'll try and give a really nice overview and include some strategies on um, you know, what you should do with intellectual property, when you should use it, et cetera. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I've been working with um, Heather Fleming, the executive director of Change Labs, for quite some time to bring this together. And I think that we're both really, really pleased and hope that this sort of um, will launch a strong gateway between Change Labs and the clinic, because this is what we're here for. And this is, I think, a really, really excellent opportunity for us practitioners and entrepreneurs alike. And the lights have gone out again. All right, forget it. Um, I have no control over this, apparently. Um, so it's, we're really excited to sort of kick this off, and hopefully we can provide some at least somewhat useful advice. Um, and after the meeting, we're going to be making available the slide deck that we have presented today, as well as a um, brief flyer that outlines all of the issues that we're going to be discussing, and then um, also a sort of FAQ type thing. Um, if I can make one request, um, feel free at any time to raise your hand during the presentation. If you have a question, you can flail your arms around any which way you'd like to do it. Um, but in addition to all the questions that we answer, um, please drop all of them in the chat as well, because we'd like to collect those questions, because I'm assuming if you have that question, someone else will as well, because then after the Brilliant. So unfortunately, um, we're low tech, so I'm just going to have to say next slide. <laughs> um, so um, next slide, please. OK, so this is a brief rundown of the topics that we're going to be covering today. Um, what is the clinic? What is intellectual property? And then we're going to cover the three most common types of intellectual property, namely patent law, trademark law, and copyright law. And then we're going to go over some strategic considerations, including how do I know when to protect my IP? What are the benefits of doing so? And then a rundown of how the clinic works and how to get your application in so we can um, start sort of working together. Okay, next slide. Um, so for a little bit of background about the clinic, um, the goal of the clinic, generally speaking, is to provide innovators with a pipeline to get sort of uh, efficient, affordable legal work to take their businesses to the next level. And the clinic tends to work with um, anywhere from like independent inventors to small businesses. And a big step forward is usually obtaining some for, like some form of intellectual property protection, whether that be their logos, their inventions. Um, and this process, if it's done by an attorney, is quite expensive. And so hopefully by operating the clinic, we can sort of help overcome some of those barriers and help launch businesses. Um, and what the clinic allows us to do is we are partially barred as students in front of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, um, and it allows us to prosecute um, intellectual property for trademarks and, um, and patents, and so we're able to sort of facilitate that process. And then I am not sure if she's joined, um, but we are supervised by Michelle Gross, um, who is a very, very experienced intellectual property attorney, and she does... Um, transactional litigation matters, and she, outside of the clinic, holds a private Arizona practice. And so all of our work is facilitated through her, and she sort of directs us and gives us guidance um, when approaching our sort of prosecution matters. Okay, next slide, please. So there are four basic categories of intellectual property, and we're going to address three of them today. So we have patents, trademarks, copyrights, and then trade secrets. Um, trade secrets are sort of outside of the purview of this um, presentation, so we'll ignore those. They're really not that relevant anyway, um, at least not here. And so we're going to start off with um, patent law, and the discussion is uh, going to be hosted by Alicia, so the, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Emily. So I'm going to give a little bit of an overview of patent law. Um, so patent law is federal law with its root in the U.S. Constitution, so there is the intellectual property clause in the Constitution, which gave rise to um, the copyright and the patent laws that we have today. So a patent is basically a right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing into the United States whatever is covered by your patent. 
And there's two types of patents. There's a utility patents and design patents. So utility patents cover um, like the utility of something, the, the usefulness of something, and then design patents cover kind of more, it's called the ornamental design um, for a physical object. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a minute here. Um, and so patent terms are limited, so you don't get patent protection forever. It's for a limited time. And utility patents generally provide protection for 20 years from the filing date of the patent application. And there's some kind of nuanced details with when the filing date is considered to be, but we won't go into those details here. Um, and design patents, which might be a little bit more relevant for what we're talking about here, are valid for 14 years from the issue date of the patents. Now I'm having trouble changing my own slides. Okay, <laughs> examples of patentable inventions can include um, simple like tools and things that you use in everyday life, such as pencils, hammers, light bulbs. Um, now all of these things have obviously already been invented and patented and the patents have long expired, um, but those are examples of patentable inventions. Um, and then other man-made items like drought tolerant corn is an interesting example. And then also things like drugs, medical devices and medical procedures can be patented. So this is just an example of what the first page of a patent looks like. <clears throat> so it shows you who invented it, the patent number, and then the date that the patent was issued. And it also shows you the filing date, which is important because when you look at a patent, um, that's what will tell you when the patent expires, which is important for knowing like how long it's valid and how long other people can uh, use the thing that's in the patent. It also shows you related patents and other documents that are related to this patent. And then it gives you an abstract, which is just like a one paragraph summary of what's covered by the patent and then a, a drawing that represents also what's covered by the patent. So in order to be patentable, something has to be new and useful. So new just means that it hasn't existed before. So it, it's something that I can't find in the real world or in the library of patents that have been filed previously. Um, it's something that's truly new. And then useful is defined as just being able to be used for something or like serving some purpose. And in order to be patentable subject matter, there's kind of four categories that we look at. So it has to be either a process, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter. And so a process is just a step or a series of steps, whereas a machine is more of like a tangible thing that can carry out a process. And a manufacturer, or sometimes it's called an article of manufacture, is just something that is created through an artificial or man-made process. And then kind of similarly, a composition of matter is like a combination of multiple substances. And then uh, in order to be patentable, something has to be an improvement. And by improvement, we just mean um, like it solves some sort of problem or provides some sort of benefit that has not been addressed before. So I wanna talk a little bit more about design patents, which are different from utility patents because they protect what's called the ornamental design of an item, as opposed to the utility of an item itself. And so then an object with a design that's substantially similar, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, it just has to be considered substantially similar um, by whoever is adjudicating the, the dispute. Um, similar to the thing that's covered by the design patent, then it can't be made, used, copied, or imported into the United States. So it kind of provides you that protection that somebody else can't use that design for that period of time that you have the design patent protection. So examples of things that can be covered by a design patent are things like fonts. Um, for example, the uh, Coca-Cola bottle design, things like the Statue of Liberty, other similar um, statues, and then, ornamental designs on jewelry. And we have the design patent cost breakdown here just to give you an idea of if you wanted to file a design patent, how much it would cost. And so the total can range from about 2000 to about $5,500. And that just depends on kind of your status, whether you're filing as an individual or whether you qualify as what they call a small entity. It's like based on the size of your business. Those are kind of um, some of the factors that go into how much it costs to file. So then these are some examples. So the underlying bead design or pattern that is on the bracelet and the rug in the slide here uh, would be covered by copyright protection. But what you could cover with a design patent would be the design as applied to a physical item. 
So the, what's called the ornamental design of this design as applied to the physical bracelet or rug would be covered under a design patent or potentially covered under a design patent. And then just to give you an idea of the timeline, if you were to file an application for a design patent, it would take about 16 months to get what's called the office action from the patent office. And so that just means once you file your application, it'll take about that amount of time to hear back from the patent office. And then that could either be an allowance of your patent or it could be what's called a rejection. Um, and that just means you have to kind of have some back and forth with the patent office um, to determine if, if they'll allow you to get a patent on that. So kind of in sum, um, patent law protects novel and useful inventions and it's a monopoly for a limited term. So it gives you a limited time um, of exclusion of other people from using that product. And then in order to prevent loss of patentability, it's important to maintain confidentiality by like an NDA, non-disclosure agreement, and file your application as soon as possible. And that's just because if you're using something that you want to patent and it's out in the public domain for a certain period of time, then that can serve as a bar to patentability. So that just means that um, after a certain period of time, you aren't allowed to get a patent on that if you've been using it publicly. Are there any questions? I think we had one in the chat, but why don't we save some of the ones in the chat maybe for the end at Q&A? Does that sound good to everyone? All right. So I think the next one is trademark law. That's me. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm Caitlin, um, and I'll be talking about trademark law. So first of all, what is a trademark? Um, a trademark essentially protects like words, names, symbols, even sounds or colors in some rarer cases. Um, that indicate the source of the goods or services. Um, and it's used to distinguish those goods and services from those manufactured or sold by others. So um, it has two main functions. The first one is to protect consumers by identifying the source of the goods, essentially, so they know what they're buying. Um, and then preserving business goodwill. So if you're a big company who has put a lot into making your products very high quality, um, we don't want someone else to be able to just take your brand name and all the associated goodwill and market some inferior product to a bunch of consumers. Um, and then unlike patents, um, trademarks can actually be renewed indefinitely um, as long as still, you're still using your trademark or your mark, as we like to shorten it to, um, in commerce. So um, there are some things you have to do to maintain your registration. Once it's registered, it doesn't just automatically extend indefinitely, um, but that is a possibility. Um, and then options for trademark registration. Um, so there's federal registration with the USPTO, which is the US Patent and Trademark Office. Um, and then there's also state registration, um, but that's less common, and we're not going to go too deep into that in this um, presentation. Thank you. Okay, so just some really basic examples of some um, trademarks. Um, you can see there are logos here that are very notable. Um, you can also trademark just, you know, your essentially brand name, the plain text. Um, and also you see down here, um, I'm loving it. Everyone knows that's associated with probably McDonald's. Um, so short phrases like that, that designate the source of the goods or services can also potentially be trademarked. So protecting native phrases, um, there's an example right there with Skoden, but, um, so to qualify for trademark protection, um, you essentially need to demonstrate as an applicant that um, you've given the phrase a secondary meaning apart from its traditional meaning. Um, and that meaning needs to link that word or phrase with the particular goods or services sold by the business. Um, so that's important, really, whether it identifies a source of goods or services is going to be what's going to determine whether you can potentially um, have trademark protection. All right, so types of trademarks. So um, there are two main types of trademarks that are relevant for us, for our purposes. So the first one is a standard character format. Um, so that is just the literal words or letters or numbers or combination of those. Um, and you're trying to, um, seeking registration for just that word without 
any claim as to like a particular font or a size or a color or any other design elements. Um, and then the second type is a stylized or design format. So this we often associate with like a logo. So um, if you want to register a mark with design elements, it can also be, you know, your brand name, but in a particular font and or color, um, any of those sort of design elements that give it a stylized appearance um, are going to be under that stylized or design format. Um, and these two types cannot be mixed in one trademark application. So let's say you have a small business. If you wanted to do just a standard character word mark, that would need to be a separate application from, let's say, a stylized logo. So the federal trademark registration process um, is really a series of steps. So the first one, which we start with, um, if you were to seek assistance through our clinic, um, is doing a preliminary search. So essentially, um, the USPTO has a website with a database where you can search for um, the mark you're looking to trademark, and you can see if there's anything similar out there. Um, and what you're really looking for in that search is whether there's the same mark or a similar mark that's already been registered or even a pending application um, for the particular goods and services that you're wishing to provide under that mark. Um, so that's what you're looking for there. And that can kind of let you know what's already out there um, and whether you will ultimately be able to have a successful trademark registration. Um, next is drafting an application. So after your search, you're drafting an application, which you will then submit to the USPTO. Um, and in this one key aspect of this is you need to draft a description of your goods or services that you're going to include in there. Um, and it needs to be specific enough to identify the goods and services you're providing. Um, but the level of specificity allowed depends on the type of goods or services. For example, um, you can't just put for clothing. Um, the USPTO likes you to identify, okay, clothing, namely, you know, what kinds of clothing, pants, shirts, dresses, things like that. Um, but other categories such as jewelry, you can just put jewelry by itself. So, um, and then third, filing the application. So once you have sort of drafted it, you're ready to file it. Um, and one decision you need to make before filing is whether you're gonna submit an in-use or an intent to use application. Um, and all that means is for an in-use application, that means you're already using your mark in commerce. Let's say you have a small business, you're already doing business under that particular name. Um, and then an intent to use application is, you know, I have this business in the works, I want to use this name, um, and I'm really close to being able to use it in commerce and make actual sales, I'm just not quite there yet. So essentially what that one will do is sort of save your place in line. Um, but I will note with that one that you do eventually need to use it in commerce and be able to show that before you will be able to get trademark rights. Next slide. All right, so some really common bars to registration um, are if your mark is deceptive. So if it has a word in there that suggests maybe it's has some quality, like let's say the term gold, if you use gold in your mark and you're selling jewelry, but your jewelry is not actually made of gold, that could be considered deceptive. Um, if there's a likelihood of confusion with any other mark, so that would include marks that are confusingly similar in sound appearance or meaning, um, and if they have the same or related goods or services. Um, also descriptive or generic marks, which just means you can't trademark the word apple to describe your, your apples that you're trying to sell because we want that to be, if it's generic like that, we want that to be, be available to everyone um, and not let certain people just sort of have a monopoly over the term apple to describe apples. Um, geographic terms and surnames are some other ones that have a little bit of nuance there, but generally those are bars to registration or they can be. Um, and then this note at the bottom, so sometimes you can overcome some of these bars by showing that um, in the consuming public, your mark has acquired some um, distinctiveness or secondary meaning so that the consuming public knows that when they hear 
you know, some term that might otherwise be descriptive, they're like, oh, well, I know that that is associated with this particular company selling these goods. Um, so there are ways to overcome it. Next slide. And then fourth, examination by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So um, after an application is filed, there'll be what's called an examiner or an examining attorney from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office that will review that application and basically determine if they should issue a trademark registration or not. Um, so generally the process is that the examiner will raise objections, sort of like rejections, um, based on certain aspects of your application. Um, and then you or your attorney will have the opportunity then to sort of argue against those um, and see if you can overcome those objections. So usually it's sort of a back and forth process with them saying, you know, here's my objection, and then your attorney along with you working to overcome those until hopefully you overcome all their objections um, or they issue what's called a final refusal. Um, I should note, even a final refusal can still be appealed. Um, so it's not really final in, in the literal sense of the word, um, but that's sort of how that process goes. Next slide. And then um, once you've overcome all those objections, um, then it will be published for opposition. So essentially what that means is the USPTO will publish um, the mark that you're hoping to register. And anyone who thinks that they will be harmed by registration of that mark has 30 days um, to oppose registration of the mark. Um, if no one opposes, then you will get your certificate of registration as long as you're already using your mark in commerce. Um, so with that in-use application. Um, and once you get that certificate of registration, um, you can use the circle R symbol um, to give others notice that it is now a registered trademark. And then lastly, there's maintenance. So um, periodically, the owner of the mark has to file specific documents. Um, to make sure to keep the trademark, trademark registration active. So you're not quite done once you have the certificate of registration. You still need to track and make sure you um, keep things updated and keep that active. Next slide. And then here's just kind of um, a comparison with what Alicia had for the patent um, timeline. So for a trademark timeline, it's usually about five and a half months um, just to... Uh, get that first office action. So to have the USPTO um, respond to your application, essentially. Um, and then total, it, the total process tends to take about 10.5 months. Next slide. And then just a really quick summary. So trademark law protects marks that identify the source or provider of goods and services, um, like we commonly call brand names or logos, things like that. Um, you have to use a mark in commerce before it can be registered, um, but you can sometimes apply before you're using it in commerce, as long as at the end you do show that you're using it in commerce. Um, and then there are some bars to registration that are listed here, um, some of which can be overcome, some of which cannot. Um, so keep a lookout for generic marks, deceptive marks. Those are usually pretty bad. It's not going to look good if you're trying to register one of those. Awesome. Thank you, Caitlin. So um, I will now talk about copyright law. My name is Amy again. So just like patent law, copyright law is grounded in the U.S. Constitution. So that allows Congress to secure to copyright owners their copyrights again for a limited time. So what is a copyright? Well, it's a form of protection provided to authors of original works fixed in any tangible medium of expression. What does that mean? Well, a copyright uh, sorry, I saw the questions. A copyright is a legal right that grants the creator of an original work exclusive rights to determine whether and under what conditions that original work can be used by others. That requirement, tangible medium of expression, just means that that work has to be sufficiently permanent or stable to permit that work to be reproduced or communicated. So, for instance, like writing a song down on paper. Now, a copyright is secured automatically when the work is actually created or fixed, which means that you own a copyright right away, but that does not mean it is registered yet. We'll talk about that in a few slides. Some subject matters of copyright include literary works, musical works, artistic works, and others. 
So for instance, like I said, songs can be copyrighted, artwork can be copyrighted, like sculptures, like a painting, like a drawing. Um, photographs can be copyrighted. I think we all know that one pretty well. Literary works can also be copyrighted, like a play, like a novel. So as we can see, many things can be copyrighted. Okay, so I know that we said that a copyright is created automatically when a work is created, but that does not mean it's registered. We'll talk about that in a second. So you don't need copyright registration to secure the copyright. So how do you just get copyright protection? Well, all you need is it has to be an original work and it has to be fixed to any tangible medium of expression. So not just an idea, but actually fixed to something like a piece of paper. But it is advisable to get a copyright registration if you want to bring copyright infringement against someone who's like using your copyright without your permission. The registration would then just create a public record and put others on notice that your work is protected by a copyright. And then you can register a copyright with the U.S. Copyright Office. Another important um, point to note is that just like patents, copyright protection has a limited time. So they can last from 70 to 120 years, depending on the type of work. So for instance, like a single author gets a copyright protection for their lifetime plus 70 years. Um, copyrights, um, there, there's different factors. Sorry, I keep looking at the questions, guys. But there are different factors that affect how long a copyright will last. So just like when a copyright is created, how many people created a work, and if it was created by an employee of a company or something like that. So overall, copyright law protects the expression of original work. You are granted copyright protection at the time the work is created and fixed. But again, that does not mean that you have a registration. You would have to enforce a registration by actually going through the copyright office if you want to obviously pursue something in court. So unfortunately, at the Lisa Foundation Pan Law Clinic, we do not currently serve copyright um, clients, but we have included a link uh, for any pro bono copyright matters in the slide deck, which you guys will receive at the end of the presentation. And now I will pass it back to Emily. Thank you. Um, to be honest, after all that, I feel like my name probably shouldn't be on the title slide because they've done the legwork. Um, but without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce um, a couple of considerations when deciding if it's the right time to pursue protection for your intellectual property. And so we're just going to run through a few different things here. Um, so for like practical matters, if you're actively using uh, like a name or logo for your work, um, and you'd like to ensure that you have exclusive rights to that, especially particularly as you're growing your business. And if it's starting to um, sort of um, gain traction, that's going to be uh, really important because you're developing value behind that brand name. And that's something that you want to protect because that's sort of yours exclusively. Um, Secondarily, if you're selling your goods on an e-commerce website, that could be Etsy, that could be, I mean, truly anything. Um, that IP is going to be more publicly available and people can engage with it more readily. And so um, obtaining some protection um, sort of gives you the ability to, at least in some ways, thwart um, infringers of certain kinds. Um, and then there's, of course, the financial considerations of um, filing fees and some of the maintenance fees, which we discussed above. Um, in order to evaluate that, that's really best done on a case-by-case -case basis. And so um, if you're trying to decide whether or not it's sort of the right time financially to do so, um, we would sort of encourage you to apply to the patent law clinic because then we can take on the case and discuss really what your business is like, where the growth is headed, and whether or not it's going to be a good investment of your time and definitely of your money. And there, are, there really are several different benefits to obtaining um, protection for your intellectual property because, I mean, it is expensive, but um, when you have knowledge, when you have something that's developed value, like a brand name where you have an invention of some kind, you have a particular pattern, um, when you protect it, it becomes a tangible asset. And this is something that you can protect um, through lawsuits. You can send you know, cease and desist letters. You can ask people to stop using your stuff. Um, and this is also something that you can monetize. This gives you the opportunity to uh, sell that intellectual property, to monetize it through uh, licensing, any sort of different number of things. And this is really best done when you have intellectual property protection. So next we'll talk about a couple, a couple of other sort of um, strategic considerations. Um, so 
The best time to consider uh, like obtaining a patent is when it's really necessary for commercial viability. And so, for instance, if you can go ahead and sell your product, your new invention for a profit and when you're going to have sort of minimal um, difficulty with um, market competitors, it's probably not particularly useful to get a patent on it because it's expensive and it's time consuming. But if there is a high probability that a large company is going to use your invention, that they're going to infringe and they're going to sell it for a lower price, which would undercut your profits, it's probably going to be the best move to go ahead and at least file a patent application because then you can um, claim some rights and you will have an advantageous um, filing date which is really, really helpful when um, considering like a, an infringement suit. Um, and then in regard to trademarks, um, if brand recognition is especially important to your company, for instance, if you have a very recognizable logo on T-shirts, um, if you have a something for T-shirts or there's something about your particular mark that is a crude value, if it is a slogan, it's I'm loving it, something like that, that's what you want to protect because that is sort of the innate value of your business and what you are um, adding to sort of the base product. And that's something that you want to keep um, sort of as an entrepreneur and as you're growing your business. So finally, we'd like to address that you can actually use intellectual property without formal IP protection. So, you know, if you have a patent, a trademark, a copyright. Um, this is a question that Heather outlined that sort of seems to get asked a lot. You can use your marks, whether that be a logo, whether that be um, sort of a phrase, a name of your company, or a patentable invention, really whatever it is. If you want to sell a new kind of you know shoe sole, whatever, um, you can go ahead and do that without formal IP protection. Um, and as Amelia outlined, for copyrights, you do actually get conferred some limited rights simply by you know, sort of creating your um, you know invention in a rough sense, whatever that is. Um, However, in order to be able to assert those rights against anyone who's copying your work, you do actually need to be registered. But this is sort of an important point to note that you can, in fact, use those things. So this is a brief outline of what the clinic actually does. And um, then I'll follow that with ways that you can get in touch with the clinic. And so our student practitioners can do a couple of things. Um, we can do uh, services for utility and design patents and then also trademark registration. Um, and all of those services, our sort of hours spent on your work is going to be free. That's always a good thing. Um, and the only cost that applicants are actually required to provide is for patent drawings for utility and design patents. Uh, this is when you actually need to visually describe something um, and is a necessary part of both of those applications. And then filing fees. The filing fees for um, trademarks and the various sorts of patents are different, and that's something that's probably slightly outside of the scope here, but we are happy to include in um, both the FAQs as well as sort of the brief flyer, um, especially for like trademarks, that sort of thing. Um, and there are a couple of things that student practitioners cannot do. Um, so as was noted above, we cannot prosecute copyright claims. And then we are also not involved in litigation. Um, so if you wish to assert your rights against someone in an infringement case, um, that's something that we cannot take care of. Um, but we also have a clinic that handles civil litigation at ASU. And um, as you can see at the bottom of the slide, that's linked there. Um, and they take those sorts of cases and can take that through um, actual litigation. So this is just a basic outline of how you can get in touch with the clinic. Um, we have the main page that includes sort of general information about the clinic, a little bit of history, and a little bit about um, our supervising attorney, Michelle Gross. Um, and if you're on that page, if you scroll down, there's a big fat yellow bar that says um, application for prospective clients, and that will take you directly to the application. Um, but in the alternative, there is a link right down below, and that will take you there as well. Um, now, when filling out the application, it's not tremendously complicated, um, but don't feel as though it needs to be perfect. Just supply as much information as you can about what your business does, um, what your marks look like, how long you've been in business, just what you're sort of doing with them. Um, and with sort of like general information with as much detail as you really have, um, 
the student practitioners can then go in and sort of evaluate um, whether or not we think you're going to have a good claim, whether or not it's enough information, if it's worth protecting, that sort of thing. Um, so when in doubt, really the best solution is just to go ahead and apply because then you know. Um, and this is sort of, it's, it's easy. I mean, the application probably takes 10 minutes tops. So we would encourage you to do so. And then uh, final slide, please. So if you have any questions, um, in addition to um, my fellow student practitioners, um, they can also drop their emails in the chats. Um, feel free to contact Michelle Gross. She is definitely the most valuable contact for these things. She is the resident expert. And then I've also attached my email. Um, so feel free to reach out if you have any questions about applying, um, any additional questions about just IP law in general, please do not hesitate. Um, Thank you. So why don't we then go ahead and um, sort of start the Q&A. Um, I've made notes of all of the questions that we have in the chat and I'll continuously update it as we go through. Um, but the first question that we have here is, um, when Change Labs had the design artists to help the um, NQBs with their logos, um, did the designers do a certain amount of due diligence to ensure the logos, patents we settled on were not infringing someone else's logo and trademark? Um, I guess I can probably answer that. That's relatively simple. Um, so if you're going through the process of um, attempting to protect any kind of IP, any of the ones that we've talked about, um, we offer an opinion letter, which is where we do a prior art search and we look at whether there are logos that you'd potentially be infringing on or existing patents that you would conflict with. Um, and that's going to inform our analysis. And then we sort of let you know if this is something that's viable, if this is something that you can do, and what sort of the chances of that are in terms of being successful. I think I'd like to jump in here and add something as well. So um, generally speaking, when you have, you're working with a graphic designer to design a logo, they typically are not going to be searching on their own to make sure that you aren't going to be infringing. So um, generally, the searches that we do in the clinic um, are in anticipation of actually helping you to register your, your trademark, your, your logo. Um, and so the searches that we're primarily looking at are, are to determine would there be any conflicting um, actual trademark registrations already. However, um, we're not typically doing what we call a freedom to operate search, which would be going out and looking, um, you know, searching the internet basically to find are there any other uh, businesses that might be using something similar that might then end up sending you a cease and desist letter simply because, um, you know, the way that you gain rights in a trademark is by using the mark first. So if there's someone out there who, um, you know, has been using the mark and your graphic designer decided to, you know, they did some searching, they said, wow, I, I like this, and they kind of formed your logo based on what someone else already had, you might run into an issue there. So um, we can't ever really guarantee that there's nobody out there prior to you that would be, uh, that would have something like that. But generally speaking, just so that you're aware, graphic designers are not doing that type of a search. So, um, you know, that's something that you want to make sure that you are um, they are aware of when they when they do that work for you. Additionally, when you're working with a graphic designer, you also want to make sure that you have an appropriate agreement in place where um, they are basically uh, creating a work a work for hire for you, and that you will then own um, the copyright rights and any intellectual property rights in that work. And you want to make sure then they've signed that agreement or. It may be part of their standard agreement that you know they would have you sign anyway when you would engage them to do the work, but you do need to be making sure that you actually own the rights to that and the designer doesn't, because otherwise if the designer retained the copyright rights and they weren't transferred to you, they could allow others to use that logo um, and there wouldn't be anything that you could do with regard to that because you wouldn't own the copyright rights. So that's something else that we can assist you with as far as um, getting a necess getting the necessary type of IP agreement in place when you're going to be working with vendors to um, help you design uh, logos or um, helping you to um, you know move an invention forward, we can certainly address that as well. Brilliant. Um, the next question I have is from Jameis, and I think I'm probably going to need you to explain a little bit. Um, so you said, can you piggyback on the original design per se? And this was in relation to um, design patents. If you'd like to sort of um, fill out your question a little bit, um, please do. 
Okay, well, I was just thinking um, my design, I do have it copyrighted, aka uh, artbonnet.com. And I was looking to superimpose additional designs upon my original one. How do I go about doing that copywriting or is that covered automatically under the original design that I have? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, what I mean is that um, if you look at my design, it's um, it's got six feathers on it and it's a circular design. I want to remove four of those six feathers and then put like, um, let's say a smiley face where those six feathers were, where those four feathers were. Is Would that be copyrighted, that smiley face upon my, upon my design? Or do I have to file a new drawing each time I come up with a new design upon that original copyright? I may be able to answer, answer this one if that's okay, Emily. Um, okay, so I think uh, if you are the original owner of that first design and it's copyrighted, then essentially what you're making is a derivative work of your original design. And if it's a derivative work, in that case, that just means it's like a work based on an already existing copyright, Correct. but because you own it, you you're giving yourself authorization. So like if someone else came in and was, and said that they wanted to make your second design, you would give them authorization, but because it's your own here, you're giving yourself authorization. You're completely fine. So it's already copyright protected the minute it's fixed to like a tangible medium of expression, but to get a registration, you would have to file a separate registration for the new one. That's what I think. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next question. Um, explain geographical bars. I can take that one. I think that was in relation to trademarks. Um, so yeah, so there are a lot of different bars. So geographic is a tricky one because um, basically what the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office doesn't want is things that are descriptive. So things that don't go beyond just describing exactly the goods and services that you're selling. Um, and so that kind of is an easier way, I think, to uh, kind of think about the geographic bar. So um, let's say that you're starting a business and you're selling clothing um, and you want to call it like Arizona clothing. And you're in Arizona, you make the clothing in Arizona, then that is sort of, it's geographic. So you have Arizona, but really the issue is you're just describing the geographical place where you're making those goods and selling those goods. And then clothing is just what you're selling. So you're selling clothing from Arizona. Um, so that would be just purely descriptive. And the sort of idea behind barring that for trademark registration is that we don't want to allow people to have sort of a monopoly on using like a geographic location. So, you know, we don't want to bar everyone else from being able to use the word clothing and the city or the state of Arizona in this case. Um, for their goods and services. So what you really need to keep in mind is trying to stay away from things that are purely descriptive of your goods and services. And that could include, you know, a geographic location because we're saying, you know, that's not um, going to differentiate you enough from other people who are selling clothing in Arizona, if that sort of makes sense. I don't know if anyone has anything to add to that. So the fourth question I have here is, I utilize a hallmark on my jewelry, which I also use to sign my two-dimensional artwork. Um, is this hallmark something that I should register as a trademark? I'm acting as the MC here, in case I should have to clarify. <laughs> I mean, I can answer that one too. Um, so the answer is, you know, it depends. So if that's something that's your like brand designation of source and you think it would benefit you and your business to um, apply to get that registered, um, you can do that as long as whatever you're, you're trying to trademark is an indication of the source of your goods and services. So I don't know for sure based on the language you use, if it's a logo or if it's, you know, your brand name or whatever it is. 
um, if you think it would be beneficial, that's something you definitely could pursue um, trademark protection for as it's an indication of the sales of your goods. Um, I can actually clarify if that would be helpful. Um, I utilize, uh, I guess you, what you would indicate as a hallmark is um, it's your way of signing your jewelry. So it's basically a stamp. And um, I stamp my name onto my work. And then um, coincidentally, I also make two-dimensional artwork, paintings and drawings. And I utilize that exact same um, signature on my two-dimensional work. And so that that was what the um, the question that I have would we would directly um, relate to. Is, is that something that I need to be protecting on my own in order to preserve my reputation and to identify my goods specifically? Or is, or is that just some um, kind of something that may or may not already be covered under copyright law? Does anyone else know more about sort of that intersection that wants to take that aspect of it? Uh, it I mean, it sounds like what you're doing. I mean, um, if you're using something as, as a hallmark, I mean, it certainly could serve as a, as a trademark, as um, a source identifier of your, of your particular work. So it, it is something that you, you certainly could pursue trademark registration on. Um, you know, additionally, anything that would be a, a design or, or um, you know, work that you've created would also be eligible for copyright protection. So there's there's really two ways that you could go about um, uh, go about protecting that. And generally speaking, I mean, if, if this is something that you are using on your jewelry, I, I would suggest that you do uh, file for a trademark registration on that. Thank you very much, ma'am. I appreciate it. Sure. Absolutely. So the next one is kind of fun. Um, would NFTs be best to be copyrighted? Um, so actually this is slightly my wheelhouse. That's a little bit shameful to say, but anyway, um, so this is actually something of ongoing dispute. Um, generally speaking, if it's something that you're using to identify, um, a business or like you want to make a copy of your NFT, um, that's something you could trademark as a design, but you're not actually, um, sort of copying the base NFT as it relates to its like location on the blockchain. Um, generally speaking, the way that you're able to identify a valid NFT is the fact that it has a location on the blockchain. So it's not actually the underlying design. Um, because I mean, at the end of the day, it's, it's on your computer. Someone could like screenshot your NFT. There's nothing really preventing that. Um, but if you're sort of treating it as an artwork, if that's sort of the, the general crux of your question, um, since it's a design, um, that's probably something that could be copyrighted because it could count as, um, you know, essentially art, um, if that sort of answers your question. Let's, um, let's move to the next one. Uh, what category would concepts fall under for IP? Um, you know, I can answer this too because... Um, Essentially, there's a little bit more to it than that, but concepts are generally not um, patentable. Uh, they need to be reduced in various different ways, reduced to practice um, and described fully. There's also a bar on um, a couple of different sort of conceptual um, categories. We don't really need to go into it, but generally speaking, concepts are not protectable. They need to be reduced into some either a physical form or, um, you know, a process, a method, whatever, um, what we went over at the beginning of the presentation. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to that or does that pretty much cover it? I just wanted to also say, like, again, ideas, I guess, if that's what you mean by concept, um, is also not copyrightable. So that's, you know, that's pretty much a bar in most of IP, um, unless you do something with that concept that then would make it eligible for protection. Um, it's for a store that I work for in Scottsdale. So it's the first native owned and operated jewelry store out of Voltown, Scottsdale. So the concept is that artists, they bring their work to our store and then we help sell it for them. And then they're still getting the credit for it, like their names on their receipt for the purchase. That way the customer has direct connection um, to the artist and that they're sitting at their price. So we've already had like one store kind of steal our concept um, and steal our, our physical address as well and put it on Google and stuff. So I was kind of wondering, I mean, that's how the store functions is that, and that's how we get our artists and our consumers is because of that concept. So I was wondering, is there any like protection for that? Because we're already dealing with weird stuff like that. I don't know if that was just loaded or. Well, generally speaking, business concepts like a method for running a business um, cannot be protected, uh, especially not as a patent. 
Um, you could send a nasty email. <laughs> I, I teach, but yeah, generally, um, that's not eligible for a patent. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, next. So I have a couple of uh, much longer questions, and I think I'm going to go ahead and include those um, on the FAQ because that's just going to be a little bit easier to break down because I think a lot of those um, include a lot of sort of subtopics. So I'm going to move on to like the next short one. Um, would trademarks on a business name give you an advantage when acquiring domain names for your business? Um, I actually don't know. I might direct this to uh, Michelle Gross if that's all right. Sure, I, I can field this one. So it doesn't give you necessarily an advantage with regard to acquiring a domain name. So um, if your concern is that someone already has a domain name that is the same as, as the name that you're looking to use as a trademark, I, I think that's maybe the root of your question and you can clarify if that's not the case. But um, you know, if, if you're looking to use something as a trademark and someone already has that domain name, and you know, if it, even if it looks like they're basically just not, you know, really using it, if they so effectively, in order, you could you could register your trademark, um, but that's not going to do anything about being able to actually wrestle the domain away from someone that has previously registered it. There is a process by which you can do that. However, you actually have to be able to show that there was some. Um, malicious intent in, in their registration and that they did not have any legitimate business purpose for it. So if someone already has a website that has a domain that would be the domain that you wanted and they're actually using it for a, a legitimate business purpose, there isn't going to be anything that you're going to do about that um, regardless of whether you register your trademark. You would just need to choose a, a different domain. So domain names and trademarks are not um, one and the same. Thank you. Okay, let's see here. Um, let's pick maybe like sort of one more. Actually, it looks like unless there are any questions that um, anyone would like to drop in the chat, it looks like the rest of them are compound questions that we're going to want to address in the FAQ. Um, do we have any last sort of questions that anyone would like to go over? Speak now. Um, forever. Oh, here we go. I have a question. Okay, so we, um, like Asha mentioned before, we do Native Art Market which was originally an outdoor market, and now we turned it into a brick and mortar as well. And a lot of people now are using the term native art market, which is totally cool. And I absolutely love that. But I just want to know, is there something I should be doing on my end to, because I've already, I do have the domain names and all of that. And I, what should I be doing to protect the, like what we actually do as far in the, the naming, like with the trademark or what? So, because I'm fine with people like, okay, for instance, recently there's a conference at Wikipa Casino in the area, and they put on their flyers and promotions, um, you know, come to this conference, native art market, um, and they're using it as a term that's, you know, they're putting a native American art market there. But now I'm getting emails from people asking me questions, and which is totally fine. I just want to make sure, like, how do I, do I need to protect myself in any way? with that. So to clarify, is your business known as Native American Art Market or Native Art Market? Is that like the name of your... Um... Yeah, that's the official name of um, the outdoor market and the brick and mortar. Okay. Um, that's something that you probably would want to trademark, um, probably as soon as possible if people are using it readily. Um, and that would give you sort of exclusive rights over that. Um, I'll jump in here too as well. Okay. So you're probably going to say one of the... Okay, yeah, <laughs> one of the issues that you're you're going to have with that is that the that the particular name is going to be most likely considered descriptive of what your business is actually doing, um, and and that's okay. Um, you can still register a descriptive name. Um, it's just that basically what happens is um, the name ends up being your your registration would end up being put on what's called the supplemental register, not the principal register at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. So you could still use the registered trademark symbol at that point after you got the registration. The problem is that you can't go out and actually enforce that because anyone is allowed to use descriptive terms. If someone else has Native American art and they're selling it, they can call what they're doing a Native art market, and that's, and that's perfectly acceptable, and you won't be able to prevent that. 
Um, and the way it works with descriptive marks is that um, typically then after, so the, a trademark registration needs to be renewed after uh, it's been registered for five years. So at that point, if you if you had a descriptive mark that was on the supplemental register and you, and basically it had become your source identifier and no one else was using it you would then be able to apply for reapply then for the the principal register um, under what we call acquired distinctiveness which means that you're certifying that um, you know to the best of your knowledge you had continuous and exclusive use of that name so that's where I see the issue coming in. If you've already got others who are already using that name, registering it, you can register on the supplemental register, and that's fine. If you, you know, so you can use the the registered trademark symbol, but you won't be able to enforce it, and you won't then be able to apply with acquired distinctiveness because you can't say that you have exclusive use. Um, the, you know, the examiner would look at that and run a search and say, look, there are lots of others who are already using that name as well. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't discourage you from applying for, you know, for the supplemental register, provided that there aren't any other conflicting registrations already registered. But um, it's unfortunately something that you're not going to be able to eventually then go and enforce because you won't be able to um, get the registration on the principal register. It's not necessarily exclusive, exclusivity that I'm looking for. It's more like I don't want two years from now after doing all this hard work for someone to suddenly somehow take it away from me. You know what I mean? So I did go out and I bought like the whole nativeartmarket.com.org. I bought all the native art market, the native art market I even bought, anything possible that could go towards that name on a domain because I didn't want someone to take all this hard work away from me just by buying a domain name that's similar to mine. So right. it sounds like you've already taken some good steps then as far as actually protecting the name and carving that out for your not necessarily that I don't want other people using it. It's just that I don't suddenly want someone to somehow take it away. You know what I mean? Legally or. Right. And they wouldn't be able to do that because you, because again, the term is descriptive. So mm -hmm. someone else couldn't go and register the term and then prevent you from using it because the term is descriptive. Yeah. Gotcha. Thank you. I got a question. This is Joe. Can I ask my question? Go ahead. Um, and let's make this sort of the, the last question, because I know people are coming up on, on the end of the lunch hour, and I um, I know everyone's probably got a, a busy afternoon. But please, go ahead. Yeah, this, and this might have, I think this was answered earlier, but just, just a briefly um, review for my logo and my design, patent design that the designers assisted with. Um, did the designers already go through some type of due diligence to ensure that whatever logos designs um, we were selecting and we settled on wasn't infringing on any other um i don't know uh, logos designs I, I just was curious about that the the ip of some other companies i think this question was answered by michelle um i can give a synopsis if you'd like or if you'd like to um sort of answer again at least in part um either way Oh, sorry. If it was answered already, I'll I'll, I'll re-review the video for the sake of time. Not a problem. It, it, it was answered, but I mean, the short answer is that no. When you hire a, a graphic designer, they're not doing a search to see if there's anything that that would be conflicting or infringing. Um, so, I mean, that that is a risk that you run. I mean, you, you do want to um, do your own due diligence on that to make sure that you're not going to run into any issues. All right. Thank you. Well, I don't know if we're going to have any closing remarks from um, Christine or Marsha. Is there anything you'd like to say to wrap up or um, should we give the sort of final statements here? Well, um, I just want to say that uh, we did record this. I did see a few people uh, show up right at the top of the hour. So uh, for those that you those of you that joined late, uh, this is being recorded. So you'll be able to go to the Change Labs YouTube channel and find this recording probably in the next within the next week or so. Thank you. Um, thank you for having us. Again, um, hopefully that this was a little bit instructive and it was certainly a lot of fun for us. Um, I would personally like to give a special thank you to um, my team here, um, fellow student practitioners, uh, Alicia, Amy, and Caitlin. They did a fantastic job. And um, a thank you again to Michelle Gross for um, helping us get this along and um, sort of answered questions that we are definitely apparently not qualified to uh answer. So thank you for having us and um, 
to everyone involved. Thank you, Emily. And Thank you. Thank you so much for, for everything, for answering our questions and meeting with us and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this little presentation for us. Thank you. It's our and for everyone else, um, just another announcement. We are hiring, so if you're interested in working with Change Labs, um, visit our website at nativestartup.org forward slash jobs. We are looking for a community advocate, communications and brand manager as well. Um, our next webinar is part three of our digital literacy series with Joe Naz. Don't get catfish, protect yourself from security threats and scams. And without further ado, I want to thank everybody for coming and we'll see you again next time. Bye.